welcome everybody, Jay Beam and Jay Savitri. My name is Tanmori Sandarajan and I'm Executive Director of Equality Labs. And it is my pleasure to be able to host this wonderful fireside chat with our colleagues, Sophia Noble and Sasha Kastanja Chak. And, um, you know, I think before we begin this panel, I just want everybody to take a little time to settle. I know that, you know, the, the moment that we're coming in, which is year two of this pandemic, has really just run havoc for all of us. And even if this is one of the last things that you do today, um, I know that there's about a year and a half of hell that we've survived. Many people have lost um, really deep and um, powerful losses from to the pandemic. And many of the activists that are here from RightsCon are also attending while their democracies are under attack um, from digital authoritarianism. And so we know how hard it is to show up, how hard it is to be present when we are also carrying the losses of so many. And so before we begin, I just want you to settle in, get comfortable into your couch. You're entering a chat with some of your best friends um, on, um, you know, about some of the things that we care the most about when it talk when we're talking about um, digital authoritarianism and, you know, bias in these platforms. But I want you to be able to be embodied. So if you can just take a breath, settle in, and think about um, the fact that we're just going to spend an hour together and think about freedom. And as we think about that, bringing all those that we've lost with us so that we can hold them as we work forward into this conversation with Grace. So thank you. Um, and again, you know, we're about to go into our panel and, um, you know, I'd like to welcome you know, Professor Sophia Noble, who is the author of Algorithms of Oppression, and Professor Sustanja Chuck, who is the author of Design Justice, Community-Led Practices to Build the World that We Need. And, you know, today's conversation is really meant to be a thoughtful reflection at the face of all of these crises, um, how we can begin to start to put our attention from documenting the problem into imagining the solution. And I think that, you know, our two colleagues here are some of the best people to riff on that idea with me because they are folks who have really helped to build this field and push the field beyond the constraints that, um, you know, surveillance capitalism would not allow us to talk about many of these issues. And with Professor Noble's work, you know, I really is, it's a, it's a really important reminder how women of color and femmes of color were the, the Cassandras as well as the canaries in the coal mine of what was happening with these technical platforms and people did not listen. Imagine if we had the wide scale societal understanding and the interest to move on the issues of algorithmic bias in 2018, when Professor Noble's book first dropped, as opposed to in 2021 after a near coup took down American democracy. Right. So I want to first bring in Professor Noble and, you know, um, Sophie, if you didn't mind doing like a, a, you know, an intro that you feel like would be helpful for people to understand where you're coming from in this conversation. I'm just wondering for, for folks who are familiar with your work or for people that are in um, democracies that are facing um, crisis because of the interventions of these colonial platforms. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are, um, you know, at this moment in times of the openings that you see, because I think people definitely see the problems, but I think that sometimes, you know, diagnosing and documenting the problem leads people to a place of despair. So I'm wondering where is the hope in what you're seeing? Thank you so much for that just incredible framing and I consider it such an honor to get to be in conversation with the two of you tonight. So I just want to um, say that I'm joining you tonight from the Gabrielino and Tonga people's land, which they have not ceded, um, where I work and live in, in Los Angeles. And I am um, really moved by the way that you started us as well with a kind of a centering and a grounding in these conversations because I think as is um, the practice of many of our communities to be present and to pay attention and to see and to connect across generations um, the conditions 
that our communities are facing is one of the most important entry points into these conversations that we can have. Um, and it, it is also a practice and a, a way of intervening um, into these conversations we're gonna have tonight. So um, I started this work myself thinking about um, where I was in kind of a very local experience of um, living in the United States working in corporate America. I spent 15 years working in advertising and marketing, and then I went back to graduate school during the recession at a time when not only were my friends and colleagues, all of us in despair financially because of what the recession was doing to our lives and to our networks, um, but I, you know, kind of entered these conversations at a time when companies like Google and Facebook were emerging powerfully into the zeitgeist in the United States. And I was interested in things, questions like, how do we disambiguate knowledge and um, wisdom from advertising? Or propaganda. That really is what, like, the kinds of questions that I had when I entered this conversation. And I saw so many people were turning to Google search to um, help them answer complex questions that uh, was, you know, akin to, I don't know, opening the pages of Vogue magazine or something, or opening the pages of The Inquirer. I mean, opening up a media space that was completely driven by advertising where there might be some good nuggets, but for the most part, um, turning away from long forms of like oral tradition and knowledge systems and libraries and other universities, other kinds of sites of expertise to, um, to move our societies forward, people were turning to these advertising platforms instead. And that's what brought me to the conversation. And so even though the book eventually came out in 2018, it was really in 2010 that I started documenting systematically the way in which uh, communities of color, women and girls of color in particular, were so profoundly misrepresented in something like a large scale commercial advertising platform like Google search. And um, of course, one of the things that we know is that people who don't have contact or relationship with our communities, in my case, in the black community, um, derive their understandings about the world from the media that they consume. And the, uh, you know, media serves as a proxy for authentic relationship. And this is one of the reasons why for 50 years, more than 50 years, uh, going back all the way to Du Bois documenting um, and taking photographs of African Americans in the United States and putting those images out in direct opposition to the way in which the scientific community was um, uh, portraying black people as scientific subjects of inferiority. Um, you know, there's been a long history of understanding that the type of media that people experience is often used in incredibly dehumanizing ways for oppressed people. Part of the project of oppression is to misrepresent and dehumanize people. And that, of course, um, allows for people to um, not only not be held accountable for acts of dehumanization because they become so profoundly normalized, but also to um, legislate and um, organize economies in direct opposition to um, oppressed people. So I was thinking about this in the context of something like Google and eventually, of course, social media, thinking about Facebook and how that practice and that project of dehumanization that we could go all the way back to early science, we could look in Hollywood with the kind of first blockbuster film, Birth of a Nation, which is one of the, like a racist KKK propaganda film, um, all the way to the way in which black girls and women were represented with pornography as a primary representation in Google, Google search when you looked for, our, for us. Um, all those practices are actually part of a systematic 
way of disenfranchising and legitimating the disenfranchisement. And in some cases, in the most extreme cases, the genocide and extermination of people around the world. And so that documentation is very important, but also making these historical linkages so that we understand that things like racist propaganda are actually not new and they didn't get invented in social media, like the proliferation of that. These we, Our communities have been engaged in resisting that kind of dehumanization um, for as long as we've been in contact with people who would seek to colonize our communities. So that's how I entered this conversation is kind of at the just at the space and place of my own experience. And um, of course, here we are, it's been more than a decade of doing this kind of research and thinking about this. And now, of course, I feel so much more hopeful because when I was first talking about this in 2010, people would tell me this is not a thing. What you're talking about, technology cannot discriminate because technology is ultimately just computer code and computer code is just math and math can't be racist, math can't be sexist, math can't oppress. And of course, this is a ludicrous for formulation. Um, I thought it was ludicrous then, but now most of us understand that are interested in following what um, big technology companies are doing and also not brand name technology companies like Palantir and other types of um, surveillance um, uh, technologies. So maybe that's just kind of like a, a way to enter and situate how I am interested in this, um, these conversations. Ultimately, to me, I would say what I'm most hopeful about is that um, not only is you know, this fantastic conference, RightsCon, giving us an opportunity to talk um, openly and frankly about the escalating um, in global inequality, um, the profound economic inequality that is around us um, and that the tech industry is also implicated in exacerbating, um, but that we are truly on the precipice of the um, watching the real-time collapse of modern liberal democracies around the world. And um, who's paying the price are the most oppressed people in those countries. And I think that, that we have to keep our eye on the prize here of thinking about what's possible, how might we reimagine the future as we always have, because it has been about reimagining the end of the transatlantic slave trade or keeping our eye on imagining um, the end of chattel slavery or the end of Jim Crow. I mean, these are things that are specific to you know, my family's history in the United States, but I think these are, um, it's in our imagining our way out of those things that we can remember there's a lot we can be doing now to imagine a future that is not organized the way we're organized today. Uh, I think that's so important because what you're saying, because I think that, um, you know, I, I've, I felt so often that in the way that you created space um, through Black feminist scholarship for what it meant to apply the politics of intersectionality to better understand the structural and implicit bias of these tech structures and the company cultures um, of big tech was so critical, I think, for other marginalized communities. And, you know, in my context, like when we're talking about decolonization, we actually first start with this idea of de which is that we're looking at the foundations of structural exclusion in the subcontinent being grounded in the violent system of caste. And, you know, it's completely expected that if you have a system of oppression that is thousands of years old, that it would find itself to digitize and make itself into the culture of um, the tech that we start to use. Because all tech is is a tool. Tech is not a utopian vision. Tech is not going to bring forth the, the next era. Tech is simply a tool by the people that design it. And, and I think what's so profound about, um, you know, some of the things that you said is that I feel that in some ways, like when when people put, um, you know, uh, theorists of color 
and queer theorists and theorists from the global south into a Cassandra position where we're seeing the problems from being the victims of the problems or from you know experiencing the structural exclusion that comes from those problems as opposed to opening us up to be the solution makers the co-designers that can bake through flawed business models that can bake through um, the questions of bias what happens is is that we become um, the test the testing ground for violent systems that end up upending all of society and this is so poignant in the subcontinent because you know for for many people here that are of Indian descent we are in a time of digital genocide what we saw in the conditions of India was because of companies like Facebook who entered the market you know around 2011 and they had their first mass atrocity in India in 2013 instead of them stopping operations and doing a human rights audit assessment or talking about what happened. Um, Tamari, you froze for a moment. Um, at a really crucial moment, we were talking about 2013, um, Facebook amplified um, mass murders that were happening and Facebook's inability to learn from that moment um, by proactively doing a human rights uh, audit or assessment and then shifting from shifting practices from that. Um, hey guys, I'm back. Are you guys able to hear me? Yes. yes we are. Are. OK, thank you guys. Uh, live in process. This is uh, this is Microsoft Teams. Okay. So in any case, um, I think the thing that was so intense was in the face of um, that massive failure, they leaned into this process and they basically polarized the environment so much so that in the beginning of 2019, we saw the Citizenship Amendment Act pass in India, which basically opened the stage for um, the largest genocidal project in world history. And that's what we were dealing with before the pandemic hit. So these questions of how we build hope in the face of increased polarization and structural um, bias in the technology that we use that abets this, you know, um, you know, uh, the erosion of democracy is so critical. And I find that so many of the activists and the and the and the community of RightsCon are so effective at documenting the problem. If you talk to any of the folks here, many of them have spent hours and hours and hours, have you know, spent years developing data sets to try to move these companies to do the right thing. And yet what we're doing is often documenting our own demise because we're invested to document the problem but not to build the solutions. And Sasha, I would love to bring um, your voice into this conversation, particularly with the work that you've done in terms of thinking about vision at the point of violence, especially with your work around design justice. And I'm wondering if you could speak to how do we start to move beyond um, the paralysis that comes from the violence that we're experiencing into creating and designing around hope? Thanks, Tamari. And yeah, it's such a pleasure to be in conversation with you and with Sophia. Um, I want to also um, begin with a land acknowledgement. Um, so I'm living and working on the unceded lands of the Massachusetts, the Pawtucket, and the Wampanoag peoples um, in the Boston area. Um, and I think that that question about how do we um, reimagine our techno-social futures um, through a lens of hope, even as we're busy documenting our own erasure um, is a really difficult one. Um, I would say, I would reach back to some of the work that actually led me to, me and you to first encounter each other, Timori. So um, back around 2003, 2004, when the Indie Media Network um, was still going really strong. So Indie Media was a transnational network of people using free software to create kind of DIY news network for self-documenting the social movements of the time, in particular, the global justice movement or the anti-corporate globalization movement that was highly inspired by the Zapatista movement in Southern Mexico and by Subcomandante Marcos's invitation for us to create a world where many worlds could fit and to create 
a sort of international communication network um, to tell to tell our own stories. So we met during that time as kind of activists and hackers, many of whom came from an anti-authoritarian left tradition, but also linked to indigenous rights movements, linked to the labor movement, linked to environmental movements and others um, were organizing to figure out how we could use this tool that kind of seemed new at the time that not a lot of people had access to. Uh, but the, the net became something where we started to say, well, we could we could document our stories, we could document those struggles, we could circulate those struggles more rapidly. And we thought that we could jump around or between the cracks of the broadcast and print media, you know, of the time. And there were a lot of beautiful things that happened during that time. There were a lot of connections that were made. There were a lot of networks of people more than anything else, more than the tools or the technologies that we created together, because those didn't necessarily last. You know, the open publishing sites that we innovated at the time quickly became obsolete or they became captured or appropriated by venture capitalists who figured out how to turn them into profitable platforms funded by ad dollars and by packaging consumer eyeballs and through the model that we now talk about as surveillance capitalism. But we created a lot of those things. We created a lot of, a lot of those tools and then they were taken from us because that's the cycle of capitalist appropriation of community-led innovation that operates not only in the media and information sector, but it actually operates everywhere. The history of capitalism is the history of people taking and owning human beings and bodies and chattel slavery and taking and owning the earth and the land and displacing and committing genocide upon indigenous peoples to take control and taking and owning ideas uh, and turning them into something that's profitable only for those who already have access to capital. So again, just sort of locating that history of community-led socio-technical innovation that actually generated these ideas that came to be known as social media, came to be known as the platforms that we're all using now, want to locate that within that much larger history of a system that uh, literally is about appropriating people's labor, time, and bodies, as well as the uh, planet Earth, um, and, and destroying all of those things uh, in the service of an abstracted idea um, that then lets people who exist at intersections or in bodies um, that have structural privilege, um, you know, get more access and everyone else gets less. So, so we were creating all of these things. There's a great story actually in the, um, in my, in my book, Design Justice, I talk about different versions of the origins of Twitter, um, and the corporate PR version of that origin story, which is that, you know, Jack Dorsey is sitting on a swing, looking into a blue sky and suddenly has a, a brilliant flash of brilliance and then creates this uh, this platform versus other stories about how Twitter came to be that include the prehistory of the free open source uh, project text mob that was created for activists to better coordinate using group text messaging uh, to help do direct action and shut down street intersections in New York City during the Republican National Convention and how text mob became sort of demo design um, for what would later um, you know, become Twitter. So we see that over and over and over again. If we look back through the history of, uh, of technology and of media technology and of social media in particular. Um, now, oh, an another great example of that would be a signal and the emergence of end to end encrypted messaging is something that really came out of anarchist hacker networks. And then the protocol gets adopted by WhatsApp and suddenly is available to you know over a billion people at the time. Um, of course, WhatsApp still shares metadata. So that's one of the most important aspects of what uh, the surveillance state likes to do and the surveillance state linked to um, capitalist companies. They work hand in hand and the metadata about who's talking to who and when and for how long um, is in a lot of ways what they need to track the, uh, both for targeted ads, but also for targeted drones, right? So I also think we want to not decouple the conversation about tracking and targeting from the 
relevance of the understanding of um, sort of sophisticated surveillance apparatus of the continued project of US military empire, military bases around the world, targeted assassinations and drone strikes, um, systematic death on black and brown bodies in order to maintain the world petroleum economy. These things are not separate, they're linked. The same firms develop them. Microsoft Azure has the cloud contract for the Department of Defense and so on and so on and so forth. But in the midst of all of that, um, even as we create these new tools and they emerge from movement spaces and from community spaces, um, just as much as they emerge from academic institutions or research sites or uh, corporate R&D departments, um, there's a cycle where we generate and create and then there's appropriation that happens um, and then we come up with new possibilities and we find new workarounds and we hack new possible modes of interacting with one another and of creating and, and sharing media. So I don't, I see hope in the fact that there's constant creation and creativity and innovation that's happening um, at the sites of the most marginalization and oppression. There's always resistance and there's, you know, where, wherever, in the Allied Media Projects Network and in the Allied Media Conference Network, we always talk about how, you know, wherever people are facing oppression, people are always also already creating solutions. And I think that that applies in the tech space as well. Um, so that's, that's how I think about that. There's always hope and cracks and new innovations emerging around the edges, even as those are always being scooped up and repackaged and resold back to people. But that process is never done because they're, you know, the, the power of capital to take, take on and take over um, and profit from the creations of marginalized communities um, is never greater than the power of human beings to imagine new possible worlds. And I think that's such a powerful and you know place to you know really move this conversation into because you know I think as you have really kind of helped to remind our audience you know in many ways the artifacts from community technology is both the the innovations in terms of process and visioning around these violent frontiers and the products and sometimes the products stay and sometimes they get lost, but the possibilities of the process are actually the lineages we need to be able to imagine ourselves out of this particular moment. And, you know, I think that, you know, Sophia, and bringing this, you know, conversation back to you, I think that when we are looking at so much of the structural exclusion that's built into these algorithms, particularly in the ways that people are starting to bring this conversation into AI and the whole ethical AI model that people are talking about, you know, in many ways, I feel that people are falling into a trap of wanting to um, accept the neoliberal half solution as opposed to accepting what is the truly visionary option here. And, and I'm wondering if you could speak to that, particularly because I think there's a lot of people who are listening who are allies internal to these institutions. You know, because institutions, whether it's big tech or intergovernmental organizations or you know, um, venture capital institutions, which the you know are part of this uh, business model that is is wrong. You know, these aren't just like big buildings. There are people, and not all of those people are ide ideologically aligned. And sometimes all they need is a spark to think differently, to open up to a greater liberatory possibility. And so I'm wondering, Sophia, if you could like help break down what is wrong about this model, but also what are the visionary options that we have out of this. Yeah, I love this framing because that's actually um, the historical frame that we need, which is to remember that for every social movement for justice around the world, there was the person who made some sandwiches. There was a person who let an activist sleep on their couch. There was a person who gave somebody a ride someplace. So everybody can really play an important part 
And it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be writing a book or that you're going to be on the front lines as an organizer always either. And this is one of the reasons why we study the civil rights movement and other um, power based movements, because we have to understand that um, we actually do have agency and we do have the power to advance and move forward human rights and civil rights and anti-racist um, uh agendas, efforts, paradigms. So I will say that one of the things that's been so interesting to watch is that, and I think I look back at even my own writing and I think, you know, when I was saying something uh, 10 years ago, like technology is a social practice, it's not just a tool, it's value laden social practice that gets codified in different ways and that there has to be an, an ethics of justice tied to the way that we think about these kinds of projects because they transform um, society in so many different ways. And this is where I think back, you know, I re remember reading a million years ago when I was an undergrad in college, I remember reading Angela Davis writing about the dishwasher and how the dishwasher was supposed to be this new liberatory tool for women, right? She, and her feminist critique is that it didn't liberate us from washing dishes as women, right? It didn't liberate us in the domestic sphere of having to reproduce the labor market. Um, what it did was raise the bar and make a higher standard of cleanliness that we all had to then adhere to. So it made more work for us, but people fancied it a tool. Um, but it actually transformed social practice and, in fact, was part of a whole parcel of um, appliances and, and projects and consumerism that ensnared us even more. Um, so I think that the reason why we have to kind of think about um, what these technologies are doing and how we talk about them is very, very important. Now, when we talked a decade ago about that there were values embedded into these projects, again, that was highly illegible, except to a kind of a small community of people, activists and scholars who were thinking about that. Now that's a much more mainstream um, concept, so mainstream that we have IBM and um, Google declaring themselves ethical AI companies and running like Super Bowl ads for it. So this is this is exactly the process that Sasha is talking about, which is this kind of capture um, that happens. And I think this is part of what we're dealing with right now is a moment of full blown capture of this conversation and reincorporating it back into the interests of the power holders in society. Um, so we're going to have to be, we need more vocabulary words. Um, the words we used 10 years ago aren't the words we can use today because now they've been distorted. They've been defanged. They've been depoliticized. Um, now what people are interested in doing is, and I see this with computer science students that come into my classroom at UCLA, you know, they want to make better algorithms. They want to make better AI. They want to make ethical algorithms and ethical AI and, and, they're interested in the techno solutionism rather than thinking about what does it mean that these um, that this entire sector is so profoundly implicated in undermining the project of multiracial democracy that is barely underway, that um, putting more resources on computer programming at the same time that we defund education. We defund the media. We defund um, every kind of public good that would help us develop a critical awareness and ability to resist these kinds of technologies is happening. Um, so we have to remain creative and agile, which I think people who are on the front lines of witnessing and experiencing the most harm are always thinking about ways to work ourselves out of those conditions. Um, in fact, that is also a feature of oppression is the impulse to be liberated 
from that oppression. And I completely agree that this is um, this is the energy that is actually going to take us forward. One of the things that I think we're way past now is this desire for ethical AI. I mean, many of us who might have said and tried to make legible that there are ethical concerns, there are concerns about injustice that are tied to the tech industry are now really far away from that conversation and saying some of these technologies should be abolished. We should have an abolitionist stance toward many of these projects and companies. Um, also, there needs to be repair, there needs to be restoration. That's actually what is required now. And I think about this, you know, um, if ExxonMobil has an oil spill and they damage the ocean and all the living creatures of the ocean and the people because the damage extends around the globe, they must be responsible and accountable for cleaning it up and for repair and restoration. And, you know, we need that, uh, you know, times a thousand or more when we think about the way in which so many of these technologies are used and are implicated in the wholesale datafication and um, predictive modeling that is about classifying every person and creature on the planet and creating pathways for opportunity for some and foreclosing opportunity for others and fully normalizing that through opaque technologies and automation. And those are the stakes. That's what's happening. That is the moment we're living in. And I think this is the thing that, um, of course, you know, I know the three of us, it keeps us up at night. Um, and it is, you know, so I will just say it is like about diagnosing, like because the problem and the the ground shifts too. So we do have to keep diagnosing, but in that diagnosis and documenting, we also find um, places of resistance and um, new language to describe the conditions and new ways of organizing and connecting and linking up and, um, you know, and uh, reimagining. And, you know, I have to say, one of the reasons why I think the tech sector has so little imagination or its imagination is really about um, domination, um, a, a t complete lack of regard for um, oppressed people around the world, like a, just a, a inability to cohere the work that they're doing um, for some people and some companies is because um, they don't have a relationship to the lived experience of oppression too. And this is one of the reasons why at a very minimal level, people want to see more diversity in the companies because that would be a site of resistance. Um, it would be voices in the room to say, you can't do that. That's illegal. You're breaking about 10 different civil rights laws <laughs> with your project, or this is going to create, you know, wide scale um, uh, harm. Um, so going back to your original question, I mean, yes, of course, we need people in every room in the world, in every conversation, um, foregrounding the concerns about justice and fairness and equity and repair and restoration. And I think that it will be people in companies um, who will also create pressure um, in those conversations too, even if it's just to be whistleblowers or to be people who walk out and say, we're not going to put our labor and our intellect in service of those kinds of projects. That's important work too. And I, I think this is so important to to hold because, you know, so much of what you're talking about when um, our ideas and our movements become cannibalized by surveillance capitalism and the need for restoration um, and repair after the harm that has been, you know, um, conducted on our, our communities, you know, it's it's so much about the language of trauma and the spirals of trauma where we we just see ourselves having to 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 come from one violence to another and and i often think that some of what we need to do is to stop you know i think we need to just pause and not just look at this moment in time but be able to say enough we're not going to be able to put a band-aid on a cancer 
What we need is time to envision the new. And I always think about, like, imagine if philanthropy funded as much money into a great imagining by the same people who are researching our demise to begin thinking about the solutions. Because when you think about something like Facebook, I mean, Facebook was started by these dudes in Harvard that wanted hot chicks. And, um, you know, it's certainly not the cultural competencies that you need for an intergovernmental organization handling, you know, democratic conversation around the world, you know. Um, but the people who saw the business potential of that was the CIA, right? And um, who was one of their first funders. And, you know, cut to Cambridge Analytica, and, you know, Facebook disrupting, you know, so many democracies around the world and not a single penny was paid in terms of reparations. Right. And I think this is what is so critical is that I think that we are so breathless from the violence. We are just so tapped in terms of just trying to get our communities out of the crises that we're in. We need time to be able to not only talk about the full scope of the harm, to then be able to demand the reparations that are required. Because this isn't just a, I need a mea culpa in front of a congressional hearing thing. This is more like a billion dollar reparations fund to support democratic processes around the world. This is a billion dollar fund that is about supporting innovations into new business models, into new developments around technology that can actually heal that can actually create abolitionist futures versus digital authoritarianism. Yeah. And especially when I think of, you know, um, you know, companies like Google and their ethical AI, I was like, why would I trust Google to build ethical AI when they couldn't keep Google Docs away out of the hands of the Indian government and turning over the IP of climate change activists who were protesting about farmers' rights? That is the most simplest task that they could do in order to not do evil, and yet they failed. So somehow, all of a sudden, there's going to be a moral compass that's going to come out of this in the face of the profit that is to be made around genocide. Yeah. And I well, think that's really the, the point, Sasha, I want to bring you in around this, is that we are dealing with situations like digital war, digital apartheid, when we look at what Palestinians are dealing with, and genocide. So again, I want to bring us back to, you talk a lot also about institutions not being monoliths, where are the opportunities and where are the visioning um, processes that we could look at in both policy and processes? Yeah, well, I definitely agree that it's hard to trust um, Google's ethical AI initiatives, especially after they've just finished um, firing Dr. Timnit Gebru and Meg Mitchell and the brilliant, uh, you know, black women and other women leadership um, because they uh, dared to publish their research findings about uh, Google's AI systems and their ecological impacts and the ways that they reproduce existing uh, biases in this stochastic pirates paper. Um, um, so it's very, yeah, it's very difficult to look at what these firms are doing and not be deeply skeptical and rightfully so, not to focus on the ethics watching, ethics washing um, as kind of, you know, that looks like that's what's actually taking place. Um, at the same time, you know, as a non-binary person, I like to complicate binary visions of what's happening. And so while I agree that there's great danger that the companies will capture the AI ethics conversation or the broader conversation about AI uh, ethics, equitable AI, transparent AI, or algorithmic justice, um, I actually think that we can also see the fact that these companies all feel they need to create these teams as something very positive. Um, I think they've been forced by a lot of different developments, including the increasing documentation of incidents of AI harm, um, by the great work of investigative journalism, organizations like ProPublica, by the work of independent uh, researchers coming uh, from all different spaces, whether it's you know the work of Joy Bulamwini and Deb Raji uh, and Timnit Gebru in the Gender Shades work um, in actionable auditing, um, or it's the work of researchers outside the academy 
who are independently developing methods to um, audit these systems, um, or it's the work of researchers inside companies that are trying to figure out um, not only how to audit systems for technical bias, but also how to uh, document harms that systems have created and also develop tooling that will enable um, less, yes, less biased outcomes, but also think about how we develop tooling for harms reporting, for incident reporting, learning from the cybersecurity industry so that we could say, um, well, in cybersecurity, every time a known hack emerges um, and it's been exploited, um, you know, that gets documented, it gets reported, it gets shared through a database uh, that's shared across industry, there's standardization, there's incident reporting and escalation, and there's rapid response teams, and there's coordinated disclosure mechanisms where people have to patch those vulnerabilities quickly before the findings get published. Like, we can learn a lot from all of those sectors to actually build better systems and while I agree with you, Sophia, that um, you know we need we need to make more careful determinations about which systems are carceral systems and should never be built, um, and which systems are systems worth building better. I completely agree with that, um, and I also completely agree that the companies want to capture the whole conversation. I also think that it provides a great opportunity in a lot of ways because one, it means that there's now hundreds if not thousands of people, you know, researchers, students who are just coming up, um, people who have just landed positions inside these organizations or have been doing this work for a long time, who are saying, finally, people are taking seriously the work we um, have been trying to do. Um, and so there's networks of people that are emerging inside these companies that are at least having these conversations. They're in dialogue with one another and they're also in dialogue with people you know, outside the, the tech sector, they're in dialogue with social movements. Um, I've been, in the last few months alone, I've been contacted by many researchers inside major multinational corporations that only now, only in the last year, specifically because of the Black Lives Matter movement, have finally gotten approval from their higher ups to launch whole new initiatives um, around race and technology um, not just in the diversity and inclusion in sort of employment space, which yes, it's important, but we know it's not enough, but also in the product team you know, space. And I see those things as very, very positive developments because imagining and then building the future or the many futures that we might want is gonna take all different types of people and all different types of skills and the degree to which um, the current moment we're living in, in terms of the pressure that social movements have created on these companies, um, and to some degree pressure that's starting to be generated um, in the regulatory space and from some of the bills that have been um, you know, introduced or are moving through the US Congress or through the EU space, um, like the Algorithmic Justice Act that's just been brought in, or the Facial Recognition uh, Moratorium and, and Biometric Surveillance Moratorium Act, um, or like the new EU regulations around algorithmic accountability that are in progress. Like the combination of strong social movements demanding racial justice everywhere, including in the tech sector, as well as um, some regulatory action that's starting to move is providing a window of opportunity for people who are working inside these companies to finally get resources and get the green light to move forward some very interesting um, projects um, including around um, better tooling, better analysis, not only of technical bias auditing, which I think is important but is very limited, but also in terms of more radical revisioning um, of what it means to do harm reduction um, in the AI systems that we do need to develop, as well as to think about which are the systems we need to not uh, say, say no to. And I think that 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 reminder is so important because, again, I want to go back to how we started this conversation, which is that I think many, many people in this sector, in especially the human rights defenders and activists and researchers that are in the global south, they are coming to this conversation not with equity. They are coming with their hearts breaking. 
they're coming with their dead. Um, you know, and I think about in India, you know, how devastated, you know, almost all the institutions that work in um, this sector are by the pandemic. And and to to think about how in the face of such cataclysm that the burden of hope um, must feel like. And yet I think that in many ways, you know, hope is a muscle, hope is an exercise, hope is a practice. And I think a lot of what, you know, both you and Sophia are really speaking to is that there are openings everywhere. You know, and I think about, you know, Tupac's like, you know, um, book, The Rose That Grew From Concrete, you know, in many ways, life always finds a way. Right. And that in this time of death, we are choosing to imagine because we are choosing life. And I've never felt such a profound need to choose life because I've already seen what the alternative is. I've already seen unspeakable things happen to my people. I've already seen people have to choose between um, eating or having the vaccine or paying rent or getting remdesivir because the intellectual property patents related to the vaccines that we paid for as American citizens are being charged to countries like India. So right. the ideas that we're talking about in terms of transformative policy, transformative business models, transformative technology, we need investment in terms of a great imagining. And when I think of that work that Joanna uh, Macy does around um, the climate crisis and thinking about the invitation to use this moment as the great turning to ask for the world that can come afterwards, this is what we need in this space right now. We need care, we need love, we need healing, we need transformation and imagination allows us to do that but that doesn't happen when people are hungry when people are in hiding when people aren't able to even do their work safely and that's unfortunately many 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 of the activists that are part of the rights con space like part of the reasons why i can't do a land acknowledgement is i don't want to reveal where i'm located because of the amount of death threats and rape threats that i receive as a Dalit activist and, you know, the virulence of digital authoritarianism and digital Brahminism. And, and I think that, you know, Sophia, I think, you know, we're coming to the closing part of our conversation. I think people look to your writing um, as a black feminist scholar and as someone who has, bring, has brought so much internationalism into this conversation for that engine of hope. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you could leave people with just a final thought about that um, before we close. You know, I ended, I closed my book with thinking about like, um, what, how could we imagine things differently? Because I completely agree with you that um, we, um, we deserve to get to live lives that are not completely constructed through trauma and oppression, where the only way we can understand ourselves is through those lenses, um, or with that our entire life and our community's lives are not defined by and this is one of the things where, you know, I love being black because even in the face of what black people experience all around the world, we have so much love and culture and community and connection and flavor and all the things that make life worth living too. And so that's a thing that is that we all have that. I mean, this is why, um, you know, I roll with the kind of communities that I roll with, which are communities that also are like, um, you know, black communities, people who also have the, the texture of understanding oppression and finding joy and working through those things, um, through those conditions. So that's incredibly um, important. And, you know, I I think that we, we don't want to forget that the conditions that we're living through right now that you are talking about um, are tied to the profoundly immoral and gross distribution of resources in the world. This is fundamental to me. I really don't care about the technology. I care about the way in which the technology sector defunds the possibilities that you're talking about of having affordable housing, of having affordable food, of having dignity in our work, of um, living in worlds where discrimination and um, oppression are not normal and expected. Um, you should not be experiencing death threats um, for speaking truth to power. 
right? We should not be living in that kind of a world where just naming the most obvious of gross injustices um, uh, generates those types of conditions, right? Those types of threats. So this is why, you know, to me, that's what I feel the most hopeful about is that we are increasingly linking the fantasy about what technology can do, what these systems can do to the real world implications of what they are not doing. And in fact, the the gross investment of resources in one sector that will privilege such a small minority of people in the world and will be used to organize more efficiently the demise of others. Those are the questions to me that we need to be thinking about. That's actually the point um, of, of studying this sector and caring about it is not for the tech, it's for the people, it's for the planet, it's for the quality of life that we wanna live and where we need to put the brakes on systems that will um, impede upon people living full, powerful, amazing, full lives. It's not that we don't have enough resources in the world. We have all the resources. It's just that most of them are concentrated in the hands of a tiny few. That's actually the challenge. And I will say that to your point, you know, your opening salvo here, um, it is the, um, the caste systems, it is the um, colorism, it is the oppression, it is the anti-blackness, it is the, um, um, the, the homophobic, transphobic, um, it is the patriarchal, I mean, um, anti-earth sentiments and sensibilities that are really about the individual and what the individual um, should have to the detriment of the collective that, you know, those are the values underneath this that we need to be challenging. And to me, part of the problem is that the tech sector really socializes us to individual hyper-consumptive kinds of ways of thinking in the world. And that's part of what we're resisting. And so I feel incredibly hopeful because, you know, um, nobody wants to live um, a, a life of in the United States of just tapping on glass the rest of their lives um, losing the ability to be creative and do work, but also people don't want to mine the minerals that it takes to make this stuff or have to sift through the e-waste and the toxicity of it when we're done with it. I mean, we have a responsibility, especially in the United States, to understand our role, especially as consumers, in relationship to these global problems. And I think that, um, um, you know, that we get have space to talk about it is incredibly important. And I agree, who's going to give us a billion dollars to go off into the woods and imagine the futures that we want, like all the tech executives get? Um, and the world that they've imagined for us is not a world we want. I, I don't think in the end, if we follow the logics um, that they've envisioned for us, it's not the world we want. And so we absolutely have to invest in other kinds of imaginaries. Yeah, I, think that you know, I would like to volunteer for listening that, you know, Sophia, Sasha and I would be more than happy to um, be able to support that, um, support the, the hosting of such a fund to be able to help make that happen, um, particularly because I think this moment is about um, lots of experimentation. Because it may not be that we're, someone's going to have the big picture answer, but what we actually need is time for people to be able to heal through experimentation and to be able to know that there's growth. You know, how did that rose grow from concrete? It was first a little shoot. And imagine if there was tons of little shoots like that, tons of little revolutionary possibilities that people from people that are coming out of digital apartheid, that are coming from surveillance capitalism, that are coming from, uh, you know, digital Brahminism. Imagine this world where we are centered, not capital. And Sasha, I'm just wondering if you can kind of bring us home um, for people that, you know, may have started to feel overwhelmed when we started, but now see a little opening and see a little possibility. How else might we open people's hearts um, at this time? Well, I guess I'll just close by saying, you know, it's, it's Pride Month. And as a trans person who's written about uh, sort of my interactions in a trans body with airport security systems and the way that they're designed to uh, reproduce cis normativity or the assumption that everybody um, identifies with the same gender they're assigned at birth and the way that technical systems 
just sort of break uh, when they attempt to reduce the dramatic and beautiful diversity of human bodies and experiences into limited binary categories. It gives me a lot of hope when I look at how, despite hundreds of years of settler colonial violence that systematically attempted to eliminate, destroy, dismember, and kill third gender and non-binary peoples in everywhere around the world that uh, the colonizers went, um, that did not work because people are not like that. And so there continues to be a beautiful uh, diversity of human bodies and genders and experiences of many, many different kinds. And the reductive categorization that so much of the tech sector is deeply invested in reproducing fails against uh, the brilliance of human experience and histories and trajectories. Uh, so we cannot be contained, we cannot be boxed, and expect us. No, I'm just saying um, there are many worlds and they're all sort of struggling to be born. And the one that the masters of tech and the world's billionaires who pay no taxes, as ProPublica just demonstrated, um, you know, their vision is only one vision among billions. And um, I have hope and faith that with organizing and solidarity and with accomplices of many kinds in many directions, um, we'll build some of those other worlds. So um, I just want to thank you for those closing thoughts and for all the people that joined us. Um, we are here, even in this conversation, building that other world. And so we just want to encourage you all to know that there's still hope, know that we're building hope through experimentations and relationships and dreaming, and to thank everyone who's showing up in these hard times and know that we see you, we hear you, we are part of one community, and we will win. So thank you. And thank you, RightsCon, for hosting this really powerful conversation. Jay Beam and Jay Savitri.